The 2024 NFL season is here. It's time for your week one must bets versus the spread. Welcome. I'm Mitch, and I'm going to help you win some money this NFL season here on the bottom line view. If that sounds good, Gronk spike the like button and don't forget to subscribe for weekly NFL best bets videos. Just like this. In the future, week two and on, this video will come out every Wednesday. Don't forget to comment your opinion on which game you are betting and which spread is your favorite bet of the week. These are my six favorite spread picks. Just recommendations, my opinion on the games. Let's get started with my first best bet for week number one. And that is a clash in the AFC South. One of my favorite teams for the 2024 NFL season. And the way I approach week one is I look at the landscape and I pretty much determine value based on how I feel a team will perform this year. How good a team is this season compared to the market. And that's where I think I get the most value out of week one. I use my intuition, my opinions on teams, my takes on teams from studying them all off season. And I take that into my bets. And I like the Texans this year. I love the Texans this year. I think they can reach the Super Bowl this season. Meanwhile, I think the Colts are... A football team with potential, a quarterback with potential, a coach that I like, but not a team I'm very high on. I think they're actually a little bit overhyped. Maybe not overrated, but overhyped. The Texans, meanwhile, I think are a team that everybody understands is very talented, but there's that hesitancy to crown them. And I'm going all in with the Texans. I think three points is not enough, even on the road. This is not a great matchup for the Colts from a player personnel standpoint. First of all, C.J. Stroud has ripped apart Gus Bradley's defense in his career so far. Just two games. But he's averaged 324 yards, two touchdowns, and a 114 passer rating in both games. Nico Collins has also gone off against the Indianapolis Colts secondary. That is arguably the least talented cornerback group in the NFL, and they're facing arguably the most talented receiver group in the NFL with not only Collins now. Remember that last game? It was just Nico Collins. They now have Stephon Diggs. They have Tank Dell healthy. These guys are going to be a pain to stop for the Colts. They have Dalton Schultz. They added Joe Mixon. Their line is actually healthy entering the season. I like how the offense and Stroud looked in the preseason, and I appreciate that we actually saw them play in the preseason. Rust should not be a factor here. The Texans are a much older and experienced team in terms of the perception. People feel they're young just because of a few players on their team like Will Anderson, Derek Stingley, CJ Stroud. But they actually have many vets like Mixon, like Daniil Hunter, like Jimmy Ward, and enough leadership that I believe in where they won't be phased by playing on the road, especially in a place and in an environment that they won the AFC South crown a year ago. I like Shane Steichen, but I also love D'Amico Ryans and the Texans staff. And I feel like the defense of the Texans has adequate ability to slow down Anthony Richardson as a rusher, which is my main concern because I, th I think Anthony Richardson as a passer is pretty bad, like overall. I don't think he's going to be extremely accurate. I don't think he's going to be on time consistently. I think that Derek Stingley can slow down Michael Pittman, for example. They don't have Josh Downs, one weapon less. They lost their tight end, Jelani Woods, this offseason. He's going to be out. The offensive line is good. Jonathan Taylor is great. But the Texans were very good against the run last year. And yes, Taylor had a successful game in the final week of the season last year. But I don't think that's going to be a reason the Colts beat the Texans. I think Richardson's going to have to make plays with his legs and his arm. And I look at Al Shair. I look at Christian Harris. I look at the speed of Jalen Petrie, the speed and the tackling ability of Jimmy Ward and these linebackers. And I look at those safeties and linebackers and the nickel spot, and I say they have the ability to slow down Anthony Richardson on outside rushes, 
I think D'Amico will bring a lot of dynamic pressures and simulated looks on third down to confuse the young quarterback into the wrong look or potential sacks or pressures, which could really turn the tide of this game. And ultimately, if the Texans get a lead here and it plays the way that I think it could play out, the Texans could jump on the Colts early, get a lead, then take the Colts out of their comfort zone, which is running the football, right? And that could ultimately result in a bit of a blowout, in my opinion. Like, if the Texans' defense is able to tee off with Daniil Hunter and Will Anderson, and the offense is just able to stay ahead, stay balanced, it's going to be very difficult for the Colts to come from behind. Now, if the Colts do get a lead, I still feel that Stroud and this receiving core can come from behind and win. So it's just a difficult game script for me to imagine the Colts actually winning. Whether it be a shootout, whether it be a defensive game, I just don't really see it for the Colts. I feel like their defensive line is definitely going to be taking a hit here. Samson Epicam out for the season. He's a major piece. And Gus Bradley's defense, I'm not a fan of. I'm not a fan of the secondary. I like the run defense overall. I think they're solid. But I think Stroud's going to have a 300-yard day. One of these receivers is bound to go off. So I like the Texans a lot here. It's only a field goal. I just see these teams in totally different tiers. Despite the Colts being a home underdog in week one, which is traditionally a good, you know, sort of trend to play, I feel like this is not the one to play. This is the opposite. You know, the reason people might be betting the Colts is simply by a trend, but I don't think anything else really supports that. And we're going to take a look at you know, our guys at Outlier and really see if anything supports our claim of the Texans here in this game so that we can look at evidence to back our uh, claims here. So we've got the Texans and the Colts and we can see the insights on the right side here. So we see that Jonathan Taylor has exceeded 17 and a half rushing attempts five of these last six games. So that's a prop to look at. But you see some of these props here. This is something you could get on Outlier. But these are what I'm looking for for my purpose here. So we got the Indianapolis Colts are 1-5 in five against the spread in their last six games as an underdog. That does support our bet. We also see that the Colts, you know, they have hit five. They have, they have hit overs on five of their last six games at home. That would also, in some way, I know that we're talking about spreads and not totals, but that would also help us in our claim for the Texans because the more points that are scored, and being that we think the Texans will score in this game, the more points that are scored, the harder it is to cover only three points, obviously. The Indianapolis Colts are 0-6 in their last six games as an underdog. That's a big stat that really helps us there, so... Outlier also likes our bet here for the Houston Texans for sure. So that's our first bet for week number one, the Texans minus three. Our second best bet against the spread is going to be the Panthers plus four at the New Orleans Saints. Now, this is a bet that I brought up previously in other best bet videos, which if you haven't checked out and you want to kind of cross-examine it, you definitely can. The Panthers plus four previously was at plus four and a half, which was obviously a better number. There's no doubt about it. But this number is still sexy to me. It's appealing to me. I, I think this is a defensive game. I think this game is very much going to go under. Um, the total is 41 and a half. I think that's probably too high. I would also look at the under here with the Panthers plus four. I feel like why I like the Panthers. I think generally the Panthers as the worst team in football last year, only winning two games by a game winning field goal are just underrated and undervalued and definitely propped up by the market. They're enticing people to bet the Panthers by adding extra points to the spread. And therefore they're pretty much inflated and giving us extra value on betting Carolina. Cause you have to be a real degenerate like me to actually bet the Carolina Panthers because nobody wants to bet on the little man, Bryce young or a new head coach in week one. Right. But luckily for us, the Panthers have the better offensive line by a long shot. They brought in a hundred million dollar right guard and hunt and a, a big pay day for Lewis at left guard. So I view the Panthers O-line as substantially better. They have a former top five pick at left tackle. They have Taylor Moton at right tackle. He's a good player. And the Saints are really, really hindered by the loss of Ryan Ramscheck at right tackle. Trevor Penning is a disaster waiting to happen. 
And you look at Derek Brown being able to penetrate the Saints in terms of their offensive line. I don't see the Saints being able to run the ball. Meanwhile, I think Carolina will have more success running the ball on the road. That definitely comes in handy. Hubbard is an underrated running back, in my opinion. Deontay Johnson is a big addition for this game in particular because he is a great separator and route runner, which will allow him to separate from man coverage, which is something that the Saints will play in this game against Bryce Young to kind of like close the window. So Deontay Johnson is somebody that I think will be targeted heavily and will allow us to also move the football for Carolina. But I think that the running game, along with some Deontay Johnson action, you know, potentially some trick plays with Xavier Leggett as well, using his athleticism, could be handy in this game. I would also look at Carolina's defense and say that I like their coach. Um, I think Evero is a good defensive coordinator. I feel like J.C. Horn, their star corner, that's rarely healthy, but when on the field as a superstar, can slow down and shut down Chris Olave, forcing you know a lot of targets to some uncomfortable players like Jawan Johnson, Rashid Shahid, guys that are less reliable for Derek Carr. Meanwhile, that pressure is coming from Clowney on one edge and Derek Brown from the interior. I think the Panthers' defense can hang in there even on the road against the Saints. And being that the Saints are a really bad running team led by Alvin Kamara in a bad offensive line and the Panthers are primarily weak against the run and not the pass. They were actually very good against the pass last year on a per play basis. So I would look at Carolina here getting four points as a defensive game most likely, but a team that I just think has some some definite advantages, has the new coach factor facing arguably the worst head coach in football in Dennis Allen, a quarterback that's heavily affected by pressure in Derek Carr. And I just think there's value on the Panthers. I definitely think they've improved this offseason. Now let's check if Outlier believes in our bet as well. So again, taking a look at the right side of the screen, the insights here. So we have the Panthers are 0-8 in their last eight games on the road. Well, that doesn't necessarily support a money line bet, but let's see if we can find anything on the spread. So Outlier so far, we're 0 for 1 to some degree. Now, this does actually help us. The under has hit in eight of the New Orleans Saints' last 12 games. That was terrible reading by me. The under hit in the last eight New Orleans Saints. Oh, man, never mind. You know how to read. The under hit in eight of the New Orleans Saints' last 12 games as a favorite. There you guys go. I finally read. I, I promise you I graduated. Uh, the under 41 and a half points has hit at a 67% rate. So that also supports us and the claim that I like the under, which I, I did state at 41 and a half, but also I feel like I like the Panthers getting four points and being that it could be an under, four points is very valuable in a low scoring game. That's for sure. It could end in a field goal. The Panthers are five and 10 against the spread in their last 15 games as an underdog. Not exactly ideal for us. Right, But of course, the Panthers have been like the worst team in the NFL lately. So uh, probably none of these are going to really support us in terms of the Panthers, you know, and you see a bunch of props here, which you guys can check out on Outlier. But to me, like, again, the, the props are not going to support us. So Outlier doesn't like this bet as much, but that's why you like to look at that information, right? So maybe that allows you to stay away from this bet if you so choose but I feel like the overall bet here is not what the Panthers were. It's what the Panthers are. It's what the Panthers are going to be. I think the coach is better. I think Bryce will be better. I think the O-line is better. I think the receiving core is better. I think the defense is underrated. So that's why I'm betting Carolina plus four. And I also believe the Saints are worse than what they've been. So that's why I'm taking Carolina. Not necessarily because of the trends suggested. And it's week one as well. So there you go. All right, next up. We have the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Minus three and a half. Versus the Commanders. The Bucs are at home, first of all. I love that against a rookie quarterback. It's been a while since a rookie quarterback has gone on the road and won a game. I think it was Sam Darnold in week one of 2018 that actually won a game the last time that happened. So, yeah, it's pretty rare that Jaden Daniels, you know, will win a game on the road as a rookie in his first ever start. Not to mention, the Bucs were a playoff team last year. They were 9-8. and eight. They won a playoff game. They destroyed the Eagles. And they made it competitive against the second-best team in the NFC last year, the Detroit Lions. Meanwhile, the Commanders were probably the worst team other than the Panthers in the NFL, or at least one of them. They were 4-13 and 13 last season. They were dreadful. Their defense was the worst in the NFL, period. And their offense, their offensive line was known for giving up sacks. You know, Sam Howell got his 
absolute ass beat all season long. So there's not a lot to like about the Commanders from last season. Meanwhile, you know, the Bucks. there's a lot to like about Baker. There's a lot to like about the champions they have on their team. Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Levante David, Vita Vea. Antoine Winfield, Jamel Dean, the list goes on. They have champions, Tristan Wirfs, right? Guys that will be ready for the season. Many veterans, many talented veterans that will be prepared. The commanders are a younger team. They're going to take time to adjust to new schemes and new philosophy from Dan Quinn on defense, from Cliff Kingsbury on offense. Not to mention, I am not a fan of Cliff's Cliff's offense. Like, I'm not a Cliff Kingsbury fan. I think he's extremely overrated. And I, meanwhile, like Todd Bowles as a defensive coordinator. I think he's excellent against the run every single year. He brings creative things to the table when it comes to blitzing and providing pressure on quarterbacks. So, I like this matchup for the Bucs. First of all, I look at their offense, and I think their offensive line is highly underrated thanks to the addition of Graham Barton at center, who looked phenomenal in the preseason. I think they're going to be able to run the ball better than expected here, and I think that their play action is going to work extremely well, especially to Chris Godwin. But Mike Evans, there's nobody on the field for the commanders. They have the worst corner group in the NFL, maybe beside the Colts, right? Like, they can't cover Mike Evans. They can't cover Chris Godwin. No chance. Like, no way. Plus, you throw in McMillan, who's a really promising rookie, and the Bucks have low-key eight excellent receiving core that's been producing year after year after year. Baker should feel comfortable in the pocket from a lack of edge rush from the commanders and should be able to make plays down the field. So love that about the Bucs. I love this bet, honestly. Like, I really do. And then you look at the other side, and I wasn't a huge fan of Jaden Daniels coming out of the draft, so I am a little bit biased in terms of what I saw on tape. I don't think that... You know, I prefer Drake May, so I, w- I was not a huge fan of Jaden Daniels. I think that he is a, you know, one read, good mechanical thrower, good deep ball thrower, but one read with excellent weapons, Brian Thomas, Malik Neighbors, and he's going to run if not. And I look at Tampa Bay and how they've handled guys like Jalen Hurts in the past, the fact that they were fifth best against rushing quarterbacks last year, the fact that they're very good at, you know, spying quarterbacks, blitzing quarterbacks from the edges, and, you know, Antoine Winfield, Jordan Whitehead could come from the edges as well at the safety spot. Like, I think Daniel's going to have his handful here. And then you really look at the depth of weapons that the commanders have at receiver. There's not much after trading Jahan Dotson. Like, like, Terry McLaurin's a good player, but at least the Bucs do have Jamel Dean who can somewhat slow him down. Uh, I'm not saying he's going to get shut out, but just slow him down. And all those blitzes, you know, that B- Bowles brings, you know, Daniels has to be able to communicate that on the road in, in Tampa Bay in a very warm, hot environment that also favors Tampa. And then, you know, third downs, it's going to be really difficult. So I, I feel like this is a Like, I don't understand why people love the Commanders so much. They're one of those teams that have had a little bit of buzz that it just doesn't really make a lot of sense. So let's see if Outlier maybe goes contrary to my belief, but let's see exactly what it has to say. So the Commanders are 1-5 in in their last six games on the road. That would actually support us. So the Commanders have not been good on the road as of late. The under has hit in seven of the Tampa Bay Bucks' last eight home games. That's just an interesting fact right there. Uh, the the Bucks are two and four against the spread in their last six games versus bottom ten scoring defenses. That's a little odd, but anyways, <laughs> that's a little odd. I don't know why playing a bad defense would actually make you cover the spread less. Let's see if we can find maybe one more. But there's a lot here in terms of Chris Godwin. Uh, I would bet Chris Godwin, Mike Evans. I like a lot of those those props for them this week. It doesn't seem like we have anything from a team perspective. Uh, that that's interesting, but in terms of you know a lot of people and a lot of money is on the Commanders, and I I just don't really understand it. You guys can see that in the public betting here, so th- they also have that on out- Outlier. But yeah, I just I I don't get it. Like from a matchup perspective, from a football perspective, to me it it all screams Tampa Bay. I I don't understand why people are saying oh Dave Canales is gone from the Bucs, that's going to make their offense way worse. I think Baker is generally an underrated player, an underrated leader. I think the Bucs are going to be way more ready than this young Washington team. So I'm going to take Tampa minus three and a half. I think they'll win pretty comfortably. Then we have the Raiders plus three at the Chargers. This was one that I've been looking at all offseason. I prefer the three and a half. There's no doubt about it. And this could still get to three and a half potentially or back to three and a half potentially. But I still like it at three. Like, I think this is going to be a very defensive game. And I just think the Raiders roster is much better than the Chargers. I think it's underrated. First of all, I 
I think the Raiders, because they don't have a Justin Herbert, they don't have a Josh Allen, they don't have a big name quarterback. People are underrating the Raiders, what they were able to accomplish under Antonio Pierce last season, their record under Antonio Pierce last season. The fact that they smacked the Chargers like 63 to 20 the last time they played, even though there was no Justin Herbert in that game. I still think that does have evidence and provide evidence for matchups and physicality and things like that. I think the Raiders are the much more physical team, and that's kind of what the Chargers want to be this year. I look at the Chargers, and I think that they have a terrible run defense and have had a terrible run defense. And I don't think that's necessarily because of scheme. I think that's because of personnel. You look at their personnel, they don't have great interior defensive linemen. Yes, Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack should be playing on the edges, but I think the Raiders can win the fight in the run game on both sides of the ball. I think the Chargers' interior O-line is not very good. I think Christian Wilkins and Max Crosby are dogs against the run. And I think that the Raiders probably have the most underrated defensive coordinator in the entire NFL. And I also just look at the perimeter matchups. Like, Jack Jones is a baller. He could have a pick in this game or a big play in this game that turns the tide. Obviously, Max Crosby or Christian Wilkins could do the same up front. And... You know, Nate Hobbs, I think, will be able to track and cover Ladd McConkey, while Jack Jones will likely draw Josh Palmer a lot of the time. Maybe Palmer has a decent game, makes some catches, but compared to Devontae Adams against what? Asante Samuel Jr.? He's probably going to catch like eight to 10 passes in this game and have, you know, third down after third down conversion. And the second corner for the Chargers is probably like Christian Fulton, who is not very good. Like Jacoby Myers is going to have a matchup all day long because of it. And Brock Bowers is also in the mix to catch some passes. So I just look at the Raiders, you know, from a perimeter perspective, I feel like they've got better matchups in this game than the Chargers do. I feel like... First of all, you know, Justin Herbert has been hurt the entire training camp, so he's probably going to be a little rusty. The Chargers probably want to run the ball a lot, given their new identity under Harbaugh and Greg Roman and Greg Roman's history of being in Baltimore and wanting to run the ball. And that's not exactly how you want to move the ball against the Raiders, or that's not necessarily going to allow them to cover a three-point spread. It's probably just going to make the game tighter and more defensive, and that plays into our hand. We look at Gardner Minshew and the ability to have open receivers and receivers that win their matchups consistently like Myers, Adams, and Bowers is going to allow him to be comfortable in the pocket. Um, so I feel like, and, and Minshew's a guy that's kind of savvy, works the pocket pretty well, right? Manages the game pretty well. Like he's, he's going to understand that the pressure's coming from the edges with Boza and Mack, and he should be able to step up into the pocket pretty effectively because the Chargers don't have great interior pass rush. So I just look at the Raiders. I feel like, you know, there's less questions about them. There's better personnel for them. Uh, and there's more dogs, in my opinion, on the Raiders. Besides the quarterback discrepancy, I don't think there's anything that leads you to believe that the Chargers should actually be a better team than the Raiders and should actually be covering this. On top of the trends that favor, you know, road uh, dogs or just dogs in general within division on week one. So you look at the Raiders plus three. I think this is a good bet. Let's see what Outlier has to say about it. So uh, the under has hit in 12 of the Los Angeles Chargers last 15 games. So that is something to consider as well. I do like the under in this game. I should have brought that up earlier, but 40 and a half is pretty intriguing for me. I do think that the Raiders getting points, a field goal is very important in this game. And then also the under is a look in this game as well. The Chargers are one in six against the spread in their last six, seven games versus top 10 scoring defenses. So there you go. Raiders are getting three points. Raiders are a good defense. They finished, I believe, ninth in scoring uh, last season as a defense, and they've only improved thanks to Christian Wilkins being added, one of the best defensive tackles in football. The Chargers are 0-7 in their last seven games straight up versus top 10 scoring defense, so maybe Las Vegas's money line might even be a better bet than the plus three. That's pretty intriguing to me. So those are a couple things that help us out and help us understand why our Raiders bet might be pretty successful from a trends perspective. So that's pretty interesting. So that's the Raiders plus three. Then our fifth best bet of week number one is the Lions minus four and a half. I wanted to give this out at three and a half and I actually did on Patreon. So if you guys aren't on Patreon, this was one of the bets that was made on Patreon. I provided the Lions minus three and a half as well as another bet that I like with the Lions. So if you want to join Patreon, the link's in the description. The link, I'll also put it in the pinned comment. It's $10 a month for all of my actual bets that I put money on. Like the bets in this video, they're useful to track on the channel. 
but I may or may not be actually betting money on all these games. Some of them, yes. Some of them, no. Some of them, I'll be betting, you know, a different, a similar bet, but maybe something a little bit different. Maybe not the spread, but something like derivative from it. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but my Patreon, $10 a month for all my bets, and I release them as I bet them so that you can get the value. And so far this week, we're 1-0, and and we're also looking at a Friday night bet uh, with the Packers and the Eagles, and this weekend we'll have plenty to choose from. So sign up before Sunday and, and get your bets in, guys. Uh, $10 a month, okay? Then we've got the Lions and the Rams, okay? So the Lions are minus four and a half at this point, but I really just love this matchup for the Lions. I feel like the Lions are not going to be slowed down in this game. They're not going to be stopped. This is also a late addition. I have not brought this up in a previous best bet video, but I love the Lions here. I just feel like Darius Williams just went on IR. So who are the Rams corners? Like a, a Tredavious White coming off an ACL and an Achilles injury, and I don't even really know who their number two perimeter corner is going to be or who they're going to choose to play most of the snaps. I know that Lake primarily plays in the nickel position, but... This is a very thin defense, it's a very young defense, and it's not a very good defense, period. They traded their captain, their leader, Ernest Jones, their probable, their best pass rusher, like other than Aaron Donald or Kobe Turner, was actually a middle linebacker named Ernest Jones, who's now on the Tennessee Titans. He's also probably their best run defender from last year. So that's really significant. They also don't have Aaron Donald anymore. They're under a new defensive coordinator, not Raheem Morris, a very experienced coach. They're under Chris Shula, who's kind of an unknown, right? Their defensive line, I think, is going to get bullied, like, all day long. They have young players like Fisk and Verse who may have upside, but this is their first game. And they're playing the best offensive line in football at home in a heavily, like, hyped-up atmosphere. It's Matthew Stafford homecoming game, right? And it's a rematch of the playoff game. And the Lions, they're going to be lit. It's, you know, Slim Shady m and is probably going to be there. Like, it's going to be like, it's going to be lit in Detroit, man. This, this, this atmosphere is going to be unreal. And the Lions, you know how their offense operates. They're going to jump out to a quick start. Ben Johnson is a wizard. They're going to get up 7-0. They're going to go down the field on their opening drive. There's going to be a couple crazy plays that Ben Johnson drew up that the Rams have no answer for. And then all of a sudden, the Rams are playing from behind the entire game. The Lions are able to run the ball down their throat, play action is working to perfection. There's no one to cover Amon Ross St. Brown. There's no one to cover Sam Laporta at a high level. They just don't have the personnel to, to, to hang with this team. Even Jamison Williams could have a couple big plays down the field. You know, Jameer Gibbs, Dave Montgomery, like, forget it. The Lions are a legit Super Bowl contender this year. The Rams are an overrated football team. They have Matthew Stafford. They have Sean McVay. They have a good offense on paper, right? But I really feel like the Lions' defense is improved. I think the Lions are legitimately very good against the run. I'm not sure if DJ Reader will suit up or not, but regardless, Alim McNeil and this defense was great against the run last year. And then you throw in Aiden Hutchinson against a little bit of a banged-up left tackle. Rob Havenstein's been banged up all offseason. Stafford's been banged up. You know, Nakua's been banged up. So they're dealing with a lot of things, lingering issues entering the season. Cooper Cup, we'll see if he really is as good as he's looked in the training camp because he was regressing last year. So, yes, I think the Rams will score some points. I could see the over happening here. But I think the Lions are just going to be relentless with their attack on offense. They're going to put up 30 to 40 points, in my opinion. Like, it's going to be bad for the Rams' defense. And on the other side... I think that the Lions will get enough stops due to their run defense, which will set them up on third down to get off the field thanks to a few blisses. I also think Carlton Davis and Terry and Arnold upgrades their secondary enough to slow down Puka Nakua to a better degree than they did in that playoff game. Uh, also, Nakua being a little hindered by a little bit of banged up injury might also help the Lions get off the field as well. So I just think the Lions are a much more talented all around team and they've got an excellent coaching staff and they're at home. So I think they win by like at least six or seven, but they could blow out the Rams. I wouldn't really be that surprised if there's a couple turnovers and it ends up being a 14 to 17 point spread. I wouldn't be that shocked. So I really like the Lions. Let's see what uh, the outlier has to say about that. So the Detroit Lions are 6-3 and three against the spread in their last nine games at home. The over has hit in nine of the Lions' last 12 games. So that would you know, also help in terms of what we discussed in terms of the game flow and the game state. We do think it will be high scoring. The Lions are 8-1 and one in their last nine games at home. 
There you go. That's that's Lions money line. So Lions have been very very good at home, over, and six and three against the spread. So all of those things would favor the Lions in this game on outlier. There you have it. Our final bonus bet of week number one is the Cleveland Browns minus two and a half versus the Dallas Cowboys. This is a game that I didn't talk about previously, but I just kind of have this feeling about the Browns and the Cowboys. The game is in Cleveland. Dallas is not good on grass. Dallas has been dealing with the CeeDee Lamb stuff, the Dak Prescott stuff, the Jerry Jones madness. But from a football perspective, Cleveland is pretty much mostly healthy. They are missing their left tackle, but I honestly think Jedrick Wills is one of the most overrated starting tackles in football, and the replacement Hudson or Dewan Jones, regardless, is almost as good, if not better. Like, I think Wills is actually, like, not even that much of an upgrade over these guys, so, like, I'm not even that worried. But the main priority here is that Cleveland's defense is healthy. And that's huge. Because Cleveland's defense, when healthy last year, was a juggernaut. Like, it was, like, all-time special. Especially at home, if you look into the numbers. So, I love Cleveland in terms of their matchup against Dallas's offense. Dallas does not have a strong rushing attack due to not having a dynamic running game or running back in general. They weren't very good running the ball last year. Cleveland was pretty good at stopping the run, so I think they'll be one-dimensional. That allows Miles Garrett to tee off against a rookie left tackle. They also have a rookie center starting for the Cowboys on the road in their first ever games against the best defense in the NFL from last year and the defensive player of the year from last year. You've got an aggressive coordinator in Schwartz who's probably going to play a lot of man coverage. Denzel Ward can match up with C.D. Lamb. He's probably the most underrated corner in the NFL in terms of man-to-man coverage. And Martin Emerson is excellent. I think he can slow down and shut down Brandon Cooks. And I feel like Greg Newsom can slow down Jalen Tolbert. They have the best trio of corners in football, in my opinion, across the board. And they've got underrated safeties. I think their secondary will be on it. And I wouldn't be shocked if Miles Garrett made a play or two that changed this game. From the other side of things, Dallas's biggest weakness on defense is their run defense. They signed multiple older defensive tackles to help them against the run this offseason, and Cleveland is going to run it down their throats. Cleveland is a good running team. Their guards are fantastic. Their center is very good. They'll be able to run the ball, which is going to set up Deshaun Watson for an easy script throwing the football. I don't trust Deshaun Watson, but what I do trust is the coaching from the Browns on both sides. I trust the offensive line running the football. I trust David Njoku against the these terrible cowboy linebackers like Eric Kendricks who cannot hang with David Njoku. And also, I think Amari Cooper is a really difficult matchup for this secondary, given that Trevon Diggs is a taller, longer corner, and Cooper is a very good route runner. He's very crisp. He's very quick. This is actually a revenge game for him, being that Dallas traded him to Cleveland. I wouldn't be shocked if he had 100 plus yards. So I just look at the primary playmakers for Cleveland. I think they're set up to have good days. They don't have Deron Bland in Dallas. So that should also set up maybe Jerry Judy or Elijah Moore to have a couple catches that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And Dallas's defense, I think, entering the year is just generally overrated. Not great against the run. Secondary is injured. There's a lot of things to be concerned about. So I think Dallas going in this game is, you know, this could be an ugly type of like, Dallas gets kind of like physically manhandled and I wouldn't be that shocked but at the same time even if it is just a defensive game I think we've got a good chance for Cleveland to pull this out being how they've played at home on defense so let's take a look at outlier to end our best bets to see what they had to say about Cleveland and Dallas so the Browns are eight and one in their last nine games as a favorite that's an excellent stat to help us right there that's nearly 90 percent The over has hit in seven of the Browns' last eight games. That would not support the game state that I think is going to take place, but I think part of that was the whole Joe Flacco run. People kind of unexpectedly saw Joe Flacco play some great football. The Cleveland Browns are 5-0-1 against the spread in their last six games at home. That's an excellent stat for us, 83%. And actually, the only other one was a a tie. So that's not bad, right? Um, So honestly, like those stats right there give us a lot just... The, the ability at home, 8-1 eight, eight is a favorite. That's, that's excellent. So 
Love what Outlier brings us for that matchup. So that might have to be a bet. So add it to the card for week number one. Those are your best bets versus the spread for week one of the 2024 NFL season. Hope you guys enjoyed. Gronk spike the like button. Don't forget to subscribe for weekly NFL picks here on the BLV. Deuces.